if we become a compassionate presence in the world, that's a gift to everyone we come into contact with. Hello, my loves. Welcome back to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. It's Eileen. Today's episode is all about self-compassion, how it can change your life and how it can be your biggest superpower. Our guest today is Dr. Kristen Neff. Dr. Kristen Neff is a pioneer in self-compassion research, conducting the first empirical studies on the construct over 20 years ago. She has been recognized as one of the most influential researchers in psychology worldwide. Kristen has written several best-selling books on self-compassion, co-founded the Center for Mindful Self-Compassion, and creator of the online self-compassion community. Hello, Dr. Neff. Welcome to the podcast. How are you doing today? Hi, Eileen. I'm doing great. I'm so happy you had me on. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So let's start with your definition of self-compassion. What does self-compassion even mean? If you want to just get technical about the term in the Latin, compassion is suffering, calm is with. So it's you know how we're with suffering. And so with self-compassion, it's how we are with our own suffering. So that's an easy way to think about it. How do we show up for ourselves in those difficult moments when we've failed or made a mistake or going through a really hard time? You know, do we sh- show up for ourselves in a compassionate, kind, supportive way? Or do we show up for ourselves in a cold, unkind, judgmental way? Mm. And so self-compassion, the easy way to think about it is just treating yourself with the same kindness, care, support you'd show to um, a loved one that you had compassion for. Mm, yeah. That makes sense. Um, So tell us more about your backstory and how and why you became an expert on self-compassion. Well, um, I certainly didn't invent self-compassion. It's it's an ancient concept. The idea that compassion should flow inward as well as outward is, you know, at the core of a lot of uh, spiritual traditions. Um, It's an ancient one. And for me, I learned about it in graduate school. So what had happened is I was about to get my PhD. I was about to do my dissertation defense, and I wasn't in a good place. I had gotten married young and divorced young. So I had a, I had just had gotten a divorce, and I was just feeling really insecure and kind of self-doubt about, you know, I can't believe I failed at this marriage. Uh, and I was also feeling really stressed about getting my PhD now, I, I thought I probably would pass my dissertation orals, but I had no idea would I get a job, would I be overqualified, you know, if I didn't get a job. And so I was, I was a bit of a basket case. And so there was a group that taught meditation just down the street from me. I went to graduate school in Berkeley. <laughs> and so there was a meditation group just down the street from me. And I thought, well, you know, I've heard meditation is good for stress. Maybe I'll check it out. And fortunately for me, um, the woman leading the group uh, talked about self-compassion. She talked about the importance of, you know, being a good friend to yourself as well as others, that compassion, if you just have compassion flow out but not in, you know, you'll be drained and depleted. And it was funny, it it had never even dawned on me, even though I was going through all this stressful, difficult time, that I could intentionally give myself support and kindness mm-hmm. like I would to a friend. Mm-hmm. So that night I went home and I tried it and I said, you know, okay, Kristen, you're going through a really hard time. You made some mistakes, but you know, I'm here for you. It's okay. You're only human. You know, uh, what, what do you need? And the immediate, uh, immediately when I made that shift toward myself, instead of kind of being just cold or problem solving, I actually asked myself, what do I need? How can I help? It became easier to bear. It took me a while to figure out this meditation mm-hmm. thing, but this mindset shift to being friendlier to myself, I saw the, the benefits immediately. And then I did get a job eventually at University of Texas at Austin. And I decided to do research on it because it had been so helpful to me in my personal life. And you might say the rest is kind of history in the sense that there's now a lot of people doing research on it. So we can get into right. that. Right. But. but you were essentially the first who decided to look at self compassion from a deep level, right? In, in academia, right? I mean, there are some other people talking. I mean, no idea is original. It's all kind of, you might say, repackaged. I mean, William James kind of talked about unconditional self-acceptance. Mm-hmm. So none of this is new. 
but specifically using the term self-compassion. And well, oh, well, and I, what I did do, which was helpful, was I created a scale to measure okay. it. So that therefore we could start to get some empirical data on people who are more self-compassionate. Uh, what are the outcomes? Yeah. From? So, so what is that scale? Like, how do you quantify something? Well, it's called the self-compassion <laughs> <Okay>. scale. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Yeah. Yeah, and you can actually, if you're interested, if you're if your listeners are interested, you can take it on my website, which is at selfcompassion.org, and you can fill out the scale. And it's just kind of face valid items. You know, I tend to be kind to myself when things are difficult, or I tend to be very judgmental, or there's there's different elements of self compassion that measures. One element is um our ability to kind of accept the fact that we're having difficult emotions versus ignoring it or suppressing it or running away with it. Also very key, how connected do we feel to others in our struggles? In other words, do we feel isolated like it's only me or poor me, which wouldn't be self-compassion, that'd be more like self-pity. Mm. Or do we remember, hey, it's human to make mistakes. All people struggle. You know, yes, yeah, some more than others, but this is part of being human. It's not just me. And that sense of connectedness actually is one of the strengths of self-compassion when we remember that we aren't so alone. So if you go to my website, yeah. you take the scale, you can measure your kindness level, your self-judgment level, your isolation level, your um, uh, connectedness level, your mindfulness level, and your what I call over-identification. Okay. So. Love that. Okay. We'll link that down below. I'll, I'll, I'm curious too. I'll take that, that quiz later. Yeah. I'm curious, how do you study self-compassion? So you measure people and then what, what are you looking at and, and what did you learn? Originally, people mainly studied self-compassion by using the self-compassion scale, but um, we started developing other methods. So there's nothing wrong with self-compassion with with scales. They can be very useful, but it's hard to know. um, If you do a correlation, it's hard to know, like, do people who score higher on the self-compassion scale score lower in depression because they're higher in self-compassion, or is it that they're low in depression? And that's, you you don't know the directionality. So other ways we do it is we uh, do what's called a mood induction. For instance, you might have someone think about something that's troubling you right now, maybe, you know, a relationship challenge or something difficult in your life, and write a paragraph with mindfulness, kind of recognizing and validating that it's hard for you right now, so turning toward it with mindfulness. Write a paragraph reminding yourself of common humanity that you know, it's only human, you aren't alone, it's part of life. And then write some words of kindness to yourself the way you might write to a friend. So we give them that mood induction and compare that to another group where we just don't say anything, Mm. which means they're probably just beating themselves up and we can see how that changes. Mm. And the other way we're doing it is we actually train people to be more self-compassionate through some of the training programs that have been developed. You know, what happens when you actually practice this daily in your life? And so they all converge, luckily. All the data really points to the same place, which is that self-compassion is very good for you. So it reduces negative states of mind. We we know this causally, not just through correlation. You know, it actually does reduce depression. It reduces anxiety. It reduces feelings of stress. Um, You know, things like eating disorders. Some people use food or alcohol as as ways to cope with their pain. And so if you're more self-compassionate, you have another resources to cope with your pain so you don't have to use these more, you know, unhealthy or unhelpful behaviors to help you cope with your pain. But the interesting thing, this did surprise me, is that it's also linked to like happiness and life satisfaction. And the reason it surprised me is like, if you look at my scale, it's all about suffering. You know, how do you relate to yourself when you've made a mistake or you failed or you're going through a stressful time? And so even though self-compassion is by definition aimed at suffering and challenge and difficulty, it feels good when we're kind to ourselves. It feels good when we remember that we aren't alone, we're part of a larger whole. You know, it feels good when we're present as opposed to just fighting things all the time. And so because compassion itself is actually a positive state of mind, even though it's, you know, holding the pain of of our life, uh, it actually generates positive emotions that leads to things like hope and optimism and creativity. So it, that's, that's part of the reason it's so powerful. It's like um, transforms our suffering into something really meaningful, which is compassion. All right, time for a short break. The show is sponsored by BetterHelp. 
Can you believe how fast this year is flying by? As we hit the midway point of 2024, take a moment to celebrate your wins and reflect on what you still want to accomplish. Whether you're building on successes or redirecting your path, therapy can help assess your progress and set realistic goals for the coming months. Through sessions with a BetterHelp therapist, I've gained a fresh perspective on my own thoughts and beliefs, which has been transformative. This process has helped me address and heal from past wounds that I've been carrying, allowing me to move forward with more peace. If you're considering therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. And you can always switch therapists at any time with no additional charge. Take a moment. Visit betterhelp.com slash TLL today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash TLL. It's nice to hear the that that you did the research and you studied this because it's something I think a lot of us would intuitively be like, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> like it, we should be nicer mm-hmm. to ourselves and love ourselves. Yeah. But you're literally proving it. You're proving that it actually works. And it's, it, I think some people need that level of validation. Yeah. Well, I can tell you where the yeah you know, where the data really helps is yeah, it may seem intuitive, but there's one area where it's not. The number one block to self-compassion is the belief that it's going to undermine your motivation. Ah. That, you know, you have to be hard on yourself and not let yourself off the hook or you have to drive yourself by like, you know, like criticizing yourself. And it's very hard to convince people otherwise. Yeah. And that's where the data is really helpful. So what the data shows is that when you're supportive toward yourself after having a setback or making a mistake or maybe you're, you know, doing a behavior you'd like to change. Um, so if you criticize yourself, it does kind of work, just like harshly punishing a child will kind of work. It'll get them maybe moving and to pay attention. But what it does is it makes it harder to learn because you're anxious and you're feeling like, oh, what does this say about me? And like, well, let's face it, shame is not exactly a great get up and go mind yeah. state. So what self-compassion does is it allows you to learn from your mistakes, not to take them personally. Okay, everyone makes mistakes or has challenges. You know, what can I learn? How can I grow? And that's actually more effective. Wow. So just to throw out a little study, if you'll indulge yes, me, we just, we just published it last <laughs> year. We did a study with NCAA athletes, right? Because, you know, college athletes, they have to be at the top of their game. It's not okay to be second best. Their scholarships are riding on it. A lot of them want to go into, pro, into the pros. So we taught them how to be self-compassionate toward their mistakes that they made in games or maybe setbacks of their training routine to kind of see it as a learning experience to be, instead of a friend, we said, imagine that you're a really supportive, good coach who wanted to give you the most constructive feedback possible. So we taught them to use this supportive inner coach, you know, in their routines. And not only did it help their mental health, but their game improved, their performance actually improved. So it doesn't undermine your motivation. Yeah. It actually enhances it and it's more effective than self-criticism. Oh, that's amazing. That's really fascinating and really encouraging to hear because I think yeah. a lot of us are taught, you know, growing up, a lot of us are raised like, oh, you have, there, there is some suffering to success or there is some, you have to have the pressure on yourself and push yourself. Why don't you talk about the, for example, something like that, the common ways that people are brought up with their mindset and how self-compassion should be, you know, the, the better way. This idea that you need to put pressure on yourself, well, there are, that, may, that it might actually be true in some circumstances, right? So again, like if you want to be a top-level athlete, you may need to really, you know, push yourself and get up early and, you know, do a lot of training. It's really more the emotional tenor of why you're doing it. Are you doing it because if you, if you don't, you're a failure or that you aren't good enough? And, you know, are you, are you kind of threatening yourself with harshness and with coldness? Or maybe sometimes you, you are putting pressure on yourself, but it's because you care about yourself, because you want to succeed. Okay. You know, you're doing it out of, because like, you want the best for yourself and that you might be willing to say, okay, well, at some point, the pressure is not being helpful. It's causing me stress. It's harming me. Well, then I'm going to let it go. It's really getting clear about your intention. Is your intention to help yourself? And if your intention is to help yourself, then it actually is a form of self-compassion. But, you know, there's, there's, there's a reason why we, we don't tend to know this necessarily intuitively. And that's actually evolutionarily. Um, it's kind of built into our brains. So we shouldn't judge ourselves for judging <laughs> ourselves. It's, it's also natural. Yep. And that's because when we feel threatened in any way, 
we immediately go into fight, flight, or freeze, mm-hmm. right? It's our instinctual response. And so we fight ourselves, we criticize ourselves, we judge ourselves thinking either it's going to get us in line, so we'll you know, not be in danger, or maybe it'll blunt the pain of others' criticism if I judge myself first. We yep. isolate ourselves in the feeling of you know shame, like we flee into feelings of shame to kind of hang our head, think we're protected for the group who may be angry at us, or we freeze and we get stuck and ruminate. Now, when your best friend has a failure, you aren't so personally threatened. So you're actually able to use another system, which is also natural, but doesn't come on come online right away. And that's the care system. You know, the tend and befriend response was, is actually designed for in-group members and family members that we were there for our people we care about, we're warm, we're supportive. We help them feel safe through our caring presence. But it was really it really evolved more for other people, whereas threat defense evolved more to protect ourselves. Mm, okay, so we have to do a little. Hack. That's why it's easier to be empathetic to others, but not to ourselves. It's evolutionary. It's evolutionary, you know. And then that, that our that our culture kind of you might say reinforces that natural tendency of the brain. So you have to do a little work. It's not hard. It comes naturally for others. We just have to do a little perspective taking, and we treat ourselves like we would a good friend. You know, we have to remind ourselves because our culture is not going to remind ourselves to do it. But once we give ourselves permission, it's not rocket science. We already know how to be supportive, at least most of us, or at least to our pets or someone right. we care about. We know how to do it. We just have to give ourselves permission to treat ourselves that same way. Yeah. And I, I just want to reiterate what you said earlier about the, the reason... The, the why matters. Like, are you pushing yes. yourself because you're afraid that people will judge you or you think you don't want to be a failure? Like there's a negative way. And then the positive way is you push yourself because you care. And, That's right. and you can't, like, it's out of love and it's okay. So you're saying it's proven that that, that is more effective. Well, yeah. So like with athletes, there's, there's a lot of research. We had another study. If you want more yeah. data, we did another study with undergraduates. Um, and we had, it was, wasn't my study, it was another researcher. They had um, these graduate students at UC Berkeley, by the way, um, take a really hard uh, test that they all failed. And then one group of them, they gave them self-compassion instructions. Like, oh, it was a hard test. You know, it's only human to fail. Don't, don't worry about it too much. And the other group, they didn't tell anything, which meant they were probably they were Berkeley students. You're probably saying, oh, I can't believe I, I failed that. I'm so stupid. <laughs> mm-hmm. And then they said, okay, well, we're going to take um, a test again. Here's some study materials. Uh, let us know when you're ready to take the test again. And the people who were instructed to be self-compassionate studied longer and harder and did better. Mm-hmm. Because again, when you aren't so threatened, when you don't have this like fear of failure learning, looming over you, you're actually more able to focus you know, you you aren't distracted by your performance anxiety. You're able to learn again from your failures without taking it so personally. Or think of athletes who like choke because they get in their heads and, oh, what does this mean about me? Then that distracts them from their game. Wow. So, it, you know, again, if you, if you unpack it, it makes sense, but it's not really intuitive for most people. So that's where data really helps. Yeah, that's really good to know. So so now that we understand how powerful self-compassion is, how do you guide, like if you were to guide our listeners to become self-compassionate, how do you adopt that mindset when you're so used to being hard on yourself? Uh, yeah. So there's um, a couple easy ways and then I can also lead a practice if you're interested mm-hmm. in that. So a couple easy ways is just to ask yourself, what I say to a friend who was in a similar situation, what I'm saying to myself right now, you know, you can ask with, hmm, no. And also, what would be the impact on my friend if I said to her, you know, you stupid, lazy idiot, something like that? Probably not a positive one. And that not very positive effect is also happening on myself. What would I say to my friend that would be really helpful, truly helpful, doesn't mean necessarily lying to your friend, telling your friend, you know, straight, but in a kind way, that's probably going to be the most helpful thing. You can try that with yourself. And so again, using the template of what we've already developed over um, the years, which is how to be supportive and kind to others, and then turning it inward. But there's another practice I like to call the self-compassion break, uh, which I can actually lead if, if you want me to. Yes, let's do it. Okay. So this is a practice where um, we actually intentionally call in the three components of self-compassion, 
which again is kind of mindfulness of our suffering, common humanity, remembering that we aren't alone, and then bringing in some words of kindness and support. Do you want me to leave? Yes, <laughs> let's do it. Okay. All right. If you want, you can close okay. your eyes just to kind of go inward. All right. So just uh, taking a moment, just start by settling into your body because we've just been talking a lot. So taking a moment to just feel your own body being present here right now. And then I'd invite you, um, Eileen, or anyone else who is listening, to think about a problem you're having in your life, some challenge or difficulty. Uh, maybe you're feeling bad about yourself for something. Maybe you made a mistake or did something you regret. Or maybe you're facing a relationship challenge or a work challenge or maybe your health um, is having some issues. So please don't choose something that's really overwhelming because you won't be able to focus on the practice if you're too distressed, but something that's it's challenging. Right, just call it to mind. So the first thing you want to do is become mindful and turn toward uh, the pain that's here. Right, just validating this. This is hard. It's hard to experience this. It hurts. And then we also want to remind ourselves of the humanity of what we're experiencing. This happens to human beings, right? You aren't alone. There's nothing wrong with you or abnormal about having this challenge. It's part of life. And then finally, bringing in some kindness, right? Some words of uh, understanding, support, perhaps sympathy. Maybe some. you might say something to yourself like, you know, I'm so sorry you're going through this. I'm here for you. Or, you know, I'm here to support you. I care about you. It's okay. You know, we all make mistakes. We can learn. We can grow. We know, and the language is really going to depend on your situation. So one thing you may want to try to do is imagine that you had a good friend in the exact same situation you are in. And then that may help um, inspire you of what you might say to be supportive and kind. And then just see if you can say something similar to yourself. Okay, and then you can open your eyes. So that's the, the basic formula, you know, one part mindfulness, one part common humanity, one part kindness. Yeah. How was that for you? I'm curious. It was reassuring. Especially the yeah. feeling not alone, like you're not the only one going through this, experiencing this, and then just just saying kind words to yourself is it feels nice. Yeah, and it's and it's supportive. That's the thing, you know. Just think, as, as human infants, we are designed by evolution to thrive in the context of care and support, hopefully from our caregivers, and you know we we can give that to ourselves as adults and it, it also triggers that sense of safety and it allows you to think more clearly and you know sometimes we just run away with things imagining that the world is coming to mm -hmm. an end i mean some people are not that some people are facing really serious trauma not to belittle that but it helps put things in more perspective and just to know that we are on our own side that we are an, an ally not an enemy when we go into battle. I mean, think about yes. that. Most people think that somehow cutting yourself down and being cold is going to make you stronger. It doesn't. It makes you weaker. Being mm -hmm. your own ally, having your own back, that's what helps strengthen you and helps build emotional resilience. Yeah, definitely. 
All right, time for another quick break. This episode is proudly brought to you by Lola V, the award-winning hair care line founded by Jennifer Aniston. Introducing Lola V, clean plant-powered products for every hair type and texture. And a special treat for you, for a limited time, you get an exclusive 15% off your entire order at lolav.com. Just use the code TLL at checkout. I've incorporated Lola V's restorative shampoo, conditioner, and glossing detangler into my hair care routine to protect my hair from damage. I appreciate their natural plant-based ingredients and signature scent, which fuses citrus, rose, lemongrass, and green tea into a spa-like aroma. Check out all Lola V products at your local Ulta Beauty location to experience the luxurious scent for yourself or head directly to their website at lolav.com. As our loyal listeners, you'll get an exclusive 15% off your entire order when you use the code Code TLL at checkout. That's 15% off your order at lolavie.com with promo code TLL. Please note that you can only use one promo code per order and discounts cannot be combined. After you purchase, they'll ask you where you heard about them. So please support our show and tell them we sent you. Your hair will thank you. I'm curious, as you begun to study self-compassion, was it easy for you to make that transition into being more compassionate with yourself? Like, how did you change through the studies? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, so I started uh, really practicing self-compassion even before I came to the point where I was ready to research it. That's it kind of, the practice started first. But over the years, I've grown in my self-compassion practice. Um, one of the times in my life, it just really, really helped is um, I have a son who, who was diagnosed with autism uh, when he was about two years old. And by that time, I had about seven years of self-compassion practice under my belt. And it made such a difference in my ability to cope. Um, so for instance, you know, the feelings that come up when, when he first got the diagnosis and I just allowed myself to feel whatever I was feeling, you know, like fear, confusion, I'll be honest, some disappointment. It's not the plan I had imagined for myself. And I just allowed myself to feel everything and really be there for myself and support myself. And what I found is the more I could be there for myself, the more I could be there for my son. Yeah, just you're more aware and conscious of your own feelings, everything. You're more patient too throughout the process. And here's an interesting tip for parents, especially if there are any autism parents, but any parent. So one of the ways our brains work is um, we've got a mirror neurons. We feel what other people are feeling literally. So we actually have empathic resonance. And so especially with parents and children, but anyone, you know, you can feel what other people are feeling and they can feel what you're feeling. And so when you're distressed, so let's say you're a parent and you're distressed and you're upset, maybe your child's tantruming or you're really upset. If you're just cold to yourself, or you know, mean to yourself, that's kind of the energy that you're giving out there for other people, including your children or your friends. But when you are self-compassionate, when you give yourself warmth and kindness and support and you feel that sense of interconnection, then other people can resonate with that. So with my son, when he was younger, he couldn't really regulate his own emotions. If he got into like a loop, it, you know, really hard to reach him when he had a severe tantrum. So I would give myself compassion. Mm. I would calm and soothe myself. And then through his mirror neurons, he he would resonate with my calmer state of mind and that would help him regulate. Wow, yeah. So self-compassion, the word self is in there, but it's really a gift to everyone. You know, if we become a compassionate presence in the world, that's a gift to everyone we come into contact with. Yeah, it just radiates out. And what, what did you call it? Mirror neurons? Mirror neurons. Yeah. That's really good to know because I, you know, I don't know the science of these things, but I just know like energy is, is real, right? You, you emanate a certain energy and people feel that. Yes. Yeah. And it's not, you know, you feel other people's vibes. You don't have to be like, have pseudoscience exactly. to understand that. We know that that's the way the brain works. Well, think about it. Parents, if they have to meet the needs of their kids before their kids know how to talk, they have to be very attuned to what their children are feeling. Mm-hmm. And so this evolved and it actually was an evolutionary adaptation as we became very empathic creatures. If I see you slam your finger in the door, the pain centers <laughs> in my brain are going to light up. Yeah. Oh, that's so funny. Okay. That that makes sense. That's why I, I, I get these cringy feelings whenever I see someone get hurt or this, someone gets a cut. I'm like, oh, that hurt. <laughs> That's why self-compassion is so important for caregivers, whether you're a parent or maybe you're a professional caregiver or you're just a very empathic person. 
again, if the compassion just flows outward and you don't attend to your own empathic pain, which is real pain, and then add on to that I'll, I'll often a lot of stress and um, you know challenge, then you will burn out. But if the compassion flows inward, like this is really hard for me as a caregiver, you know, I'm maybe someone's telling you a really painful story and you feel like a hundred percent of your attention should be on that person because they have the painful story. Well, in fact, you need to have some of your attention be on yourself as you're receiving the story and how hard it is for you so that you can stay open, so that you can keep your heart open. And also the more you generate compassion inside, the more resources you have available to give to that other person. Yeah. You know, it's not like a zero-sum game is additive. The more compassion flows inward, the more resources we have available for others. Um, and so that's why it's, I mean, I, I'm passionate about this. All caregivers need to understand self-compassion to stay in the game, really. Yes. And when you're saying you're giving yourself self-compassion, for example, with your son, right? Are you, is it yeah. just like that meditation you were doing? Are you, spe- like, what does it look like? Are you speaking to yourself or I don't know? Yes. So it's going to depend on the circumstances. So if your moment of suffering is your boss who's just said something <laughs> really like annoying, you probably don't want to like close your eyes. <laughs> you know, so you want to be careful. So you can just do it by, it's really a mindset shift. You can do it just by internally saying something like, wow, I cannot believe my boss just said this. I am really hurting you know, poor thing, it's going to be okay, I'm here for you. You can just say it internally, no one has to know. But if you're in a situation where you've got a little more leeway, one thing that's really effective is physical touch. And that's because, again, evolutionarily, so the care system was designed was designed to care for others is triggered by touch. So again, babies, the way parents communicate care to babies is through touch. Mm-hmm. So what we know physiologically is when you put your hands on your heart or your shoulders or your face, it actually triggers the parasympathetic nervous system. It changes your physiology. It helps your body feel cared for literally. So touch. So my son, you know, I didn't mind in front of him. I put my hands on my heart or I kind of rock myself. You can do that. It'd be very helpful. Saying things to yourself out loud if no one's listening, if that helps. Um, But other things, you know, it could be um, playing your favorite song as an act of self-care, having a cup of tea. It's it's really just asking yourself, what do I need right now that would really help me right now? And then trying to give that to yourself. Yeah. No, that's really nice. I like your examples because it gives us tools, right? It doesn't have to be one thing. It doesn't have to be meditation. It's like this, putting your hands on your heart, hugging yourself. That's actually very powerful. It's it's small, but but it, 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 it changes like something. And, and the best thing, the best time to practice is in the moment where you're suffering, where you, where you or have that thought or that feeling of inadequacy or that pain, and, you know, doing it on the spot, putting your hands on your heart, talking to yourself in a kind, supportive yeah. way, asking yourself, what do I need? That's the best time to practice. Uh, and, but also we've, so I've developed, um, co-developed with a colleague, something called the Mindful Self-Compassion Program. And you can take the training or we've got workbooks and I have a self-compassion community. I've got so many resources um, where you can actually learn the skill of self-compassion. So though the best time to practice self-compassion is when you're suffering, the best time to learn it is when you have a little headspace, you know what I mean? So actually, you can actually intentionally learn these skills. What are the practices I can do? And something like meditation can be very helpful for building the resource of self-compassion, having it be more instinctual, Mm, practicing with others, sharing stories so you know you aren't alone. Right. So you're saying the skill of self-compassion is not just something you do in the moment, but it's a lifestyle, right? Something you consistently show up to. It's really a commitment. It's a commitment to yourself. You know, uh, and there are, there are skills. Like I think we've got 32 practices, you know, and different things work for different people. There are writing practices you can do. Some people like to journal. Um, For some people, it's just touch. That's all they need. There are phrases you can develop. There's there's just like a million different Mm -hmm. ways to make it easier. Because remember the reason it's not that it's difficult. It actually is easier to be self-compassionate than to be self-critical in terms of its effect on you. It's like, what feels better, this? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, oh, yeah, this is actually easier. Yeah. But be, because of evolution, this fight, flight, or freeze, freeze response, and our culture, I mean, how many of us w- were raised with the idea that it's good to be self-compassionate? 
We were told we should be self-sacrificing, that we should be hard on ourselves to learn and push ourselves and to grow. And so we have to fight some forces that make it seem difficult. So that's why practice helps, remembering help, having community of people to um, help remind you can be very, very helpful. Yeah. Telling your friends, you know, make a deal. Okay, we might help me be self-compassionate. You can help each other be self-compassionate. So you mentioned the the that it's a commitment. So in your life, what are the habits or routines that you do to support your self-compassion journey? Well, see, I'm kind of lucky because my work is, you know, that's all I do is self-compassion. So I talk about it. I teach it. I I guess I've just created this community online where all, all I'm doing all day long is thinking of like content I can create. So I'm probably not typical because, because I made my career out yeah. of it. But if, even if it's not your career, there's lots of different ways you could incorporate it. I know, for instance, we taught this to um, nurses at a children's hospital. And they put little sticky notes <laughs> at their office. Remember to be self-compassionate. Remember, you know, t- take a self-compassion break. It can be something as simple as that. Some people do like to have maybe five minutes every morning where they do a self-compassion break or some little practice. Uh, there's a lot of great books out there. Um, you can take, again, take workshops. So uh, I think the, the nice thing about like buying a book or taking a workshop is you, by the very act of doing it, you are kind of making a commitment. But even if you don't want to do that, just, you know, you can put a little reminder on your phone. Are you treating yourself the way you would treat a good friend in the moment? <laughs> yeah. You know, just, it's just beginning to have that awareness and then you would know how to shift it. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Mm. So first you need, so, so first you need the mindfulness, yep. that's the awareness. Uh, and then these other two elements, the, the kindness and the warmth. Um, but this this in, this common humanity piece is so important because the way the brain works, we just naturally tend to feel like it's only me who's having this problem. Like we we imagine, it's not true at all, but we imagine that everyone else is living a normal, perfect life and it's just me who has this problem. And partly that's because people often don't share their their problems and they kind of, especially on Instagram and social media, you know, they all show the really good filtered as <laughs> touch up photos. So just consciously remembering, okay, what does it mean to be human? Well, what it means to be human is to be flawed, to make mistakes, to have challenges. That's how we learn. That's how we grow. That's what makes us interesting. You know, so remembering that, that you aren't alone, that this is part of being human, that nothing's wrong with you for having this can really help counteract those forces. Because when we feel all alone and isolated and and lonely, then the shame starts arising and it it makes it so much worse than it it needs to be. Yeah. I I know that a lot of people struggle with negative self-talk and even just those negative beliefs, like I'm not good enough. And and so I, I know they might understand this concept, but what like practical ways do you help people guide people to let go of those negative minds, like thoughts? Well, so one thing that's really interesting is, um, you know, so one way to talk about the negative self-talk is the inner critic. And the inner critic is a a part of ourselves that's actually serving a function. So this part of ourselves, if you're really going to dig down deep, is actually trying to help us stay safe. And so it's often criticizing ourselves because we think either help us change in a way that'll help us be safe, you know, or maybe it learned as a child that, you know, um, if you didn't get in line, you're going to be punished in some way. So this is a part of ourselves that's kind of taken on the role of keeping us in line through criticism. And it, so its intention is good. But it, the, the, its uh, outcome is not yeah. so good <laughs> because actually it doesn't yeah. help. It's, it's not nearly as effect, uh, effective as compassion and understanding and support. But this part of ourselves, it only knows one thing. It's got the whip and it's using it out of a desire to help ourselves. The problem is if we, if we try to suppress this part of ourselves, like just let it go and like just not believe it or suppress it, then it says, but wait a second, there's a problem we got to fix. And then it takes over the system. Yeah. So that all we hear is the voice of the inner critic. So really useful approach is to, first of all, have some compassion and appreciation for inner critic that works so hard and has agreed to take on this burden <laughs> of trying to help yeah. us through the whip. You know, thank you, inner critic. I really appreciate your efforts. 
Um, but could you make a little room for some other voices to come <laughs> in? So we also have other voices, right. like the compassionate part of ourselves that speaks so easily when it's giving advice to a friend or is there for a friend. I mean, this compassionate part knows what to say, is really, you know, comes online easily for others. So inner critic, would you mind making a little room for this other part of me, my compassionate part to speak up? You know, and so, but it's really about embracing all of our parts, including our negative self-talk in compassion, understanding that the reason is it's not because we're mean or bad. We're just trying to stay safe. We just want to be loved like all human beings want to be loved, you know, and then once you have that, so, so in other words, we don't exclude anything from the circle of compassion including that negative self-talk. And then it loses its hold, it loses its grip. Yeah, that's a great perspective shift because I think a lot of people talk about changing and letting go of the negativity. But like you said, it's literally wired, like literally wired in our brain. And so just be grateful for it, just, right? Be grateful for it and say, okay, maybe as a few good tidbits, but don't have to believe that the emotional message of that we're unworthy and, you know, it's like, it's trying to help us keep safe, but it's not often these parts form when we were very young, we weren't mature, you know, we, we didn't have much perspective, you know, and again, it kind of comes from this fear response. Yeah. So the more compassion you can show to your inner critic, the more compassion you can show for all of you. And also, and again, this the more compassion inward, the more compassion outward. Yeah. And compassion for your inner critic could also be compassion for how that critic came to be like, maybe it's the voice of your parents. And then some people hold a grudge yeah. against, oh, you, you made, you know, you instilled this mindset in me, but it's having compassion for them as well. Right. Yeah, that's right. So, I mean, a lot of parents that, you know, they're kind of doing the best they can. So even though we know from the parenting literature that encouraging and supporting your kids is more effective at motivating them than criticizing them. A lot of people don't know that. And maybe that's the way they were raised. So at some level, you know, it's kind of misguided attempts to, to help people and especially to keep them safe. And so remembering that allows us to kind of relax and open our hearts a little bit. Um, and then so these other parts of ourselves that are more intelligent, kind of wiser, more mature, that they can speak up and guide us. And it's interesting, those parts are usually, not always, but usually the parts that come online with the good friends we care about. Yeah. You know, we have, we all know what that, we have, you call it your higher self, your compassionate self, whatever you want to call it, but it's there. It's a part of ourselves. This is the good news. We don't have to invent a whole new skill. It's already inside of us. We just, the skill is really learning how to access it, remembering to access yes. it. Yes. So let's talk about how to teach children self-compassion. I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of young parents listening to this who, you, you know, what, what advice do you have? for teaching the next generation self-compassion. Yeah. So the, the best way to teach kids about self-compassion is to model it out loud if you can. So first of all, um, not even just out loud, because like I say, if you, if you, if you give yourself compassion and you embody self-compassion, your kids will actually pick up on that and it will help them. They'll resonate with your compassionate presence even better, or maybe yes and, not better mm -hmm. than, but yes and, modeling it out loud. So next time you make a mistake, for instance, and maybe you, you're, you know, you break your grandmother's precious face that you love instead of saying, oh, I'm such an idiot, you know, and your kids are getting the message, oh, okay, that's the best way to talk to myself. You can say, okay, first of all, oh, oh, I'm so bummed. I love that face. Oh, that's sad. Well, you know, it's human. It happens. You know, maybe, maybe I can learn. Maybe next time I'll do something different and I'll try my best. But, you know, it's kind of part of life. Mistakes happen. So, so anytime, a lot of it's the tone of voice you model with yourself as well. You can do it out loud. So children really start to pick up on that. So that's one way. And then also, um, as kids start developing friendships, which is around six or seven years old, they start learning the idea of what does it mean to be a friend? If a parent, if you can just add in there and remember, it's also important to be a good friend to yourself, right? So, you know, and if your kid does something that's not friendly to themselves, she can say, mm, was that, is that being a good friend to yourself? You know, how might you reframe it so be a better friend? So, so, so the context of friendship is really uh, effective for young kids and even into um, adolescence. And then once you get to the teen years, it can be really helpful is, um, 
really emphasizing common humanity because part of the adolescent brain and just normal part of development is feeling like no one else has ever been in love. Yeah, no the one teen else angst, ever felt right? No, yeah. just, yeah, right. That's just part of being an adolescent. Mm-hmm. So any reminders or helpful things that, you know, actually it's normal, mm-hmm. you know, other people do feel this way. Does it mean you're less, you, you have to be careful with this because some people interpret that to mean like somehow that I'm not special or there are people dying in war zones and my suffering doesn't count. It's not comparative. It's just really, it's honoring the humanity of our experience, knowing that what we're going through is part of the human experience. It's a shared experience. We aren't these separate individuals who are cut off from humanity. Yeah. Uh, and also, this is another important part. Compassion is a human right. Like the moment a baby is born, it's worthy of compassion. We don't have, it doesn't have to go to graduate school yep. to be worthy of good yep. care, right? So this is, this is intrinsic to our humanity. And so really um, emphasizing that with our kids uh, as well as with ourselves, really kind of builds that notion in. Yeah, it's really tied to helping them understand that they have self worth as well. I, I know you call it compassion, but it's really tied to like self love. Just just so many things that are good for you. They're they're very overlapping. So self worth can be either conditional or unconditional. For most people, it's conditional. It comes from being special and above average. It comes from succeeding. It comes from being liked. So self-compassion, because it's rooted, the worthiness is rooted in our flawed humanity, so mm-hmm. to speak. It's a box you can always check, yeah. always a flawed <laughs> yes. me, you know, Can't you deny that. special and above yep. average, you know, then it, it, it provides a source of unconditional self-worth. And actually there's research that, that shows that. Um, and so self-love, self, there definitely compassion involves self-love. The reason I don't use that term as much is because it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not clearly defined. Does a narcissist love themselves? Well, maybe, maybe not. I mean, it's, it's, it's a fine term, but I like self-compassion because... Yeah, it's more specific. And also compassion. So think about the difference between compassion and pity. Compassion has connectedness built in. If I pity you, you aren't going to like it because I am still separate. I look down on you. If I have compassion for you, it's like, hey, I've been there. So it's an inherently connected way of being. And so I like the word self-compassion because it reminds of us of our inherent connection. Self-love, it's a, it's a great word, but sometimes we kind of, if it's too self-focused, it may not be healthy or it may actually feel isolating. Yeah, it can be confusing. So why do you love yeah. yourself? You love yourself because you're a human being, which means that the love kind of is spread around and it, it's a, it's larger than our small separate self. Yeah. What about for, we talked about how social media makes it hard for a lot of us struggle with comparing ourselves to others. So what advice do you have for being more self, more compassionate to ourselves? Yeah. So um, first of all, just bringing awareness to social comparison. I mean, you know, so when I was young, we didn't have like likes on you know Facebook or we didn't have number of Instagram followers or all those kind of objective markers that make that really increase the social comparison and things like the filters and kind of the 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 ways of presenting oneself that you know it's really it's hard today because of all the um pressure to compare yourself mm-hmm. to others. So I think that first of all, just being aware of this pressure, like is start to notice, are you saying to yourself something like, how do I stack up compared to this person? Um, first of all, don't judge yourself for doing that. Give yourself compassion for it. Getting in touch with the, the pain of that, the pain of feeling isolated or the, the pain of even the need to compare yourself. And then to the extent that you can kind of correct that tendency by um, remembering your common humanity, you know, that both in positive and negative ways. We all have flaws. No one's perfect, even though your pictures are perfect, but Mm -hmm. we all have strengths. You know, we're all a unique combination of strengths and and weaknesses. Um, Being there for yourself uh, in the difficulty of it. And then um, to the extent that you can just really remember that your worth isn't dependent on succeeding. Yeah, Your worth comes with your... The fact that you are a living, breathing being, you're a being with a capital B, you know, this beautiful being, this is where your worth resides. 
Um, the other stuff is just kind of your brain yeah. trying to make sense of the world using these kind of objective markers, which aren't very useful. Yeah, no, I love that. It is just, it is really powerful to put your worth into something that cannot be taken away. Like literally you exist and that's why you're worthy. <laughs> that's why you're yeah. worthy because you're a human exactly. being. Exactly, yeah. a flawed human being. And everyone checks that box as a human. <laughs> And that's why self-compassion also increases compassion for others because then you can start like moving away from valuing people's worth on what they do or what they achieve or how they look, Um, but simply because they are a human being who's, you know, just wanting to be loved and be safe and, you know, be happy like every other human being. All right, Kristen, if you have a final message that you want to share with our listeners today, what would that be? So one message I would give is that, uh, you know, you we self-compassion, the research really supports this. It's like a superpower. When difficult stuff arises, if we bring out self-compassion, again, you know, some mindfulness, common humanity, kindness in the moment, it makes a dramatic difference in our ability to cope and to be happy and to, you know, to achieve our goals. So you have the superpower and it's already in your back pocket. You don't have to go to the store to buy it. You don't have to meditate for 20 hours a day to get it. You, It's part of our physiology evolutionarily. We're caring people by nature and you've developed it in your relationship with friends, your pets, your loved ones. So it's sitting there in your back pocket, ready to pull up at any moment when you need it. You just have to remember that it's there. That's really reassuring to hear. Thank you so much. Um, okay, where can we find you online? It's selfcompassion.org. If you just Google self-compassion, you'll find me. Um, And I'm really excited. I just started this new self-compassion community to make it really easier for people to to discover self-compassion. And I have practices. I have like workshops in there. You can uh, take uh, videos. I have a mentor sessions. If you want some sessions with someone, you can actually mentor you through the process of self-compassion. I have events. I've really created it. It's like a little self-compassion world. Mm. And I just launched this last week, which is why I'm so excited about it. But I really wanted to figure out how can I best help people discover self-compassion? And this is my new offering. And I really, um, I think it has a lot of potential for helping people find their way home to self-compassion. Beautiful. That's so exciting. I'm excited for you. Thank you so much, Kristen, for coming on the show today. And everybody, make sure you definitely check out her links. And remember that self-compassion is a tool we all have access to. Yes. Thank you so much.